Welcome to the second annual M Women Seminar. My name is Trina Dasgupta. I am the program director for the M Women uh, program at the GSMA. And I am so excited to see this room packed full of people who have joined us today. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsors, Qualcomm, as well as the Australian Agency for International Development who've made this seminar possible with their generous support. I'd also like to thank the um, US Agency for International Development and our 30 plus industry partners who have joined us with their commitment to close the mobile phone gender gap, which I will tell you a little bit more about shortly. But before we begin, I would like to invite Chris Locke, Managing Director of the GSMA Development Fund, and Sean Covell from Qualcomm to join us for a few brief words. feels a little bit like an award ceremony. Um, I know. <laughs> so thank you everyone for coming. Um, this was an incredibly oversubscribed session, so um, you're the lucky few that are in the room um, to experience the content that we're going to have later on. And I would like to also um, join Trina in thanking Australia Aid, USAID and Qualcomm um, for being sponsors of this and being sponsor of the program overall. Um, this is probably one of the most significant programs now that we have in the development fund. And it's also one of those that has grown incredibly fast. This is a program that's still only two years old and really in terms of activity is no more than a year old. But it's one of those that has really captured the imagination of the industry and captured the imagination of our partners and our operators in what they can do and what they can achieve, sometimes quite simply, in being able to provide mobile services that really do have an impact on women's lives. And one of the things we've seen just before this session in the announcement with Indosat and Nokia is that sometimes by doing very simple things such as providing health information, education information to help mothers, to, to, to help wives, to help daughters, to help babies, you can provide services that really do significantly have a massive social change. And that's really what this program is all about. This is a very broad program. There isn't a single tool that we're suggesting people launch that has an impact. What we're asking people to do is really understand what women need in their country. And later on, um, Trina's gonna be going through a significant piece of research that we've done exactly on that, understanding what women's wants and needs are in the markets. And then looking at those wants and needs and saying what services need to be put in place um, in those countries and for those women. And by doing that, we will have a significant social change. We will have a massive impact in these countries. From anything as simple as just targeting women and putting them on a poster for the first time in a country, we can have a significant cultural impact. By creating services that provide information to women for the first time, we can enable women to start their own businesses and have a sense of autonomy. By going even further and building financial services for women, we can put them in control of their money for the first time within their culture. So this is one of the largest programs we have now with a very large and burgeoning group of partners, but I still pledge if anyone is in the room and they haven't become part of this program, look at the content today, listen to the work we're doing, and please join in. We have a tremendous amount of information, tools, and research, and indeed people that we can give you to help understand women needs in your market and deliver on those. So please do talk to the team, enjoy the session today, but far more importantly, become part of this program, because it's only gonna grow from here and it's only gonna have even more impact and even more success. But at this stage, I'd like to hand over to Sean. Thank you again for the um, sponsorship, and hope you all enjoy the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, and I want to welcome everyone to this important event that is not only relevant to those of us in the industry and to women around the world, but really to the entire wireless ecosystem. I'm honored to be here with you today, and I'm very pleased to be representing our Qualcomm Wireless Reach Initiative and co-sponsoring this event with Australia AID. We greatly value the relationship that we've built with the GSMA, and we thank the GSMA Empowered Brands for hosting today's seminar. Qualcomm's passion really has always been um, to expand the possibilities of mobile, and today our passion is turning the ordinary mobile phone into an extraordinary powerful mobile computer. We're the world's largest supplier of chips for mobile devices, and we believe that our innovative technologies are providing opportunities for the more than one billion men and women around the world who use 3G technology every day. 
It took 10 years for 3G subscriptions to pass the 1 billion mark in 2010, but we expect our second billionth subscriber by early 2013 and the third billionth by 2015. That means we'll be adding 2 billion 3G subscriptions in approximately four to five years, which amounts to 10 subscribers added every second. I'd also like to note that 3G is just 20% of the total mobile subscribers globally. This means there is still great potential for growth, um, which benefits the industry and people around the world, but especially, I think, women. 3G growth has been meteoric, but total mobile connections have also increased rapidly, having already surpassed fixed broadband subscriptions and are on track to reach 6 billion in the first half of 2012. This immense growth has led to a scenario where wireless devices are increasingly more affordable and accessible. And these low-cost devices can provide women from rural and urban areas with up-to-date information and enable them to communicate with others around the world. They can also increase opportunity and provide the tools for finding jobs close to home. In fact, as the GSMA Women in Mobile report told us in 2010, 41% of women business owners in developing countries reported an increase in their income and professional opportunities because of their mobile phones. By providing female entrepreneurs with connectivity and raising the profile of entrepreneurship among policymakers, Wireless Reach is working to help close the mobile phone gender gap. And yes, there is a gender gap. As we also learned, a woman is 23% less likely to own a phone in Africa and 37% less likely in Southeast Asia. From our perspective, we believe that the M Women efforts are valuable to Qualcomm, the telecom industry, and the wireless ecosystem. We have a shared mission in providing the tools, access, and services necessary to enable women's leadership and empowerment. And like the GSMA M Women, Wireless Reach also believes that there's more work to be done. So on behalf of Qualcomm and our Wireless Reach initiative, I want to thank the GSMA and all those in attendance. We're thrilled to be a part of this seminar. Thank you. Thank you so much. There is indeed a gender gap in mobile phone ownership. There doesn't have to be a gender gap in mobile phone ownership. And our fundamental premise is that when, as an industry, we commercially focus on the women's segment, that that will be the most sustainable and impactful and fastest way to create social impact for women, which we know then benefits their families, their communities, and countries. So what we're going to talk about today is how do you actually make that happen? It's, it's wonderful to have pretty pictures and, and to talk about the exciting opportunity, but what does it really mean to target um, women in emerging markets? What are the challenges you might face? What are the opportunities you might look, um, be looking for? And what are the, some of the tools that can help you along the way? So there's four things we're going to talk about today. The first is a framework to design your business case. In partnership with USAID, we've spent the last year with consultants in the field trying to develop a business case. We thought we could go out and design the M Women business case. We were quickly proven wrong. Um, ultimately, the M Women proposition is different in every market. It's different every operator and every business, and it's different for every segment. I often say when I speak that women are not a segment, we're half the population. Um, and so it's important to really understand what's required within your business to find the right segment of women in order to achieve your commercial goals. So I'll share that framework with you shortly. Then I'll share with you a piece of research that we've been doing over the course of the last nine months, um, also thanks to USAID and AusAid, and in partnership with TNS. This, what you have in front of you, which you've all received today, is the first of about six to eight reports that we're going to release over the course of the next year. So we spent nine months in Egypt, Uganda, Papua New Guinea, and India to really find out more about the women that we were trying to reach. And where this came from is, you know, we have to fundamentally understand people better before we can design a service or campaign for them. I come from a consumer products background, and if I was consulting for a beverage company, I didn't just know when you drank the beverage, I knew what time you woke up in the morning, what music you liked, what color you were into, and then we designed campaigns around your life, not just around the specific product. And when it came to women, 
we, knew, we found out that there's very little information available for the mobile industry. When it came to underserved women, we knew less. When it came to women who were living on less than $2 a day, we knew basically nothing. And so we went out to say, what are your wants and needs? What is happening in your life? And also about your mobile phone usage so that when we design products and services and campaigns, that it was based off of their lived needs. So this report today is a short version of that. The stories that you see in that report are a composite of our research. So we wanted to maintain the privacy of the women that we were speaking to. So these are not real stories, these are composite stories based off of hard data. So we did ethnographies, day in the life, um, living with um, families, trying to understand what they were doing. We did qualitative studies with uh, men and women, and we did quantitative studies. On um, International Women's Day, we'll release another, and there will be more, which I'll tell you about shortly. Then we'll tell you about a piece about what is, in fact, the social impact. Um, we found some things in our study, but we wanted to make sure that we understood what everyone is saying. So I'll share something with you that we've done um, called an impact pathway, which we did um, in partnership with PwC, who's here in the room. And then we're going to have a really fantastic panel. This is now available on mwomen.org, and so I'm not going to go into it in detail. But what we did was that we looked across the proposition life cycle. So everything from defining your market opportunity to getting your consumer to retaining your consumer and identifying what we know your objectives are, what are the opportunities for you, and what are the strategies and tools to get there, because there are very real barriers. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I do want to highlight one example. At a most basic level, if you're trying to target the women's segment, you need to obviously size the market, right? What we found is that is perhaps the hardest thing to do, that we as an industry, particularly in emerging markets, are not tracking operational data by gender. As you know, we're in prepaid markets. We don't always know who our consumers are. And we couldn't find ways to get the information. So our team of, of very creative consultants went out to find what were the proxies? What could we try to figure out? And they did everything you could possibly imagine, from taking um, KYC registration data for mobile money and seeing if we could match that against known female first names, um, seeing if there were Mr. Ms. Mrs. within SIM registration, something that we could track, because a lot of our existing registration forms for the mobile industry just simply don't have a gender box. It just didn't occur to us. So you know, it's just these small things that we can do to make a difference. Um, inbound calling or outbound calling from your call centers. You know, or what are the things that we can do? And based off of that, we can better understand our segment. I'll leave you to look at this more online, but the most fundamental piece, as I mentioned before, is customer insights. And so to do that, we went into this research. And I'm going to, at a very high level, give you a lot of statistics. And I will leave it to you to go deeper into the report. The statistics that I'm going to share with you are at a macro level across the four countries that we focused on. I do have to thank Per Helmerson and Bob Bergwijn from TNS, who are the masterminds behind this research. And they've been living and breathing this for the past nine months. And it's, it's really an excellent piece of work. In terms of usage, what we learned was that there was good news and bad news. So 82% of the women that we spoke to, and these are women, remember, who are living on less than $2 a day had used a mobile phone at least once. So we know that there is a mobile phone ownership gap. We know that lots of women don't have it, but at least they had used it once. Um, I'm going to talk in a minute about some controversial information we have around SMS, but at least we know the phones are out there. An important statistic we found was that of 85% of the households that we were speaking to, it's the man who gets the phone first. So if you want to reach women, you have to think about what is the affordable package to get more than one phone in the household. The women is either going to be the second or the third, because in some markets, it's the firstborn son who gets the second phone. So we have to think about, you know, we're talking about multiple handset households before we get to women. We know that women face a technical barrier. Phones are not always that easy for them to use. Most women are in, in the markets that we're talking about don't have um, a lot of education, and we'll speak to that in a moment. 47% of the women said that their husbands taught them how to use their phones, and 34% had taught themselves. So what that tells us is if we create more intuitive and user-centric designs in our operating systems and in our handsets, that it will become easier and, um, for women to use the phones and that they'll feel more comfortable with the technology. And then the, this is one that's on the not so great side. 29% um, of the women we spoke to said that they felt their mobile phone made them a target for thieves. 17% that said who we call lapsed owners, so they've stopped owning, is because the phone was stolen and they didn't bother to buy a new one. 
Um, those of you who are in our working group were with us in South Africa where we heard anecdotal stories of, of women in Kailicha, which is a, um, a township in, around Cape Town, where the women had two phones. They had the cheap phone, that the low-cost handset that they took out with them when they went you know, public transport or wherever they were going, so no one would want to presumably steal it. But they had their Blackberry and their smartphones at home because they wanted to get on Facebook, they wanted to get on Twitter, they, you know, they wanted to do all the same things you and I want to do, but they didn't want to be robbed or raped for it, which is what was happening. When we asked women what was most important to them, so part of the study, as I said, is about their wants and needs. And we did two things. We asked about their life priorities, and we had a set of attitudinal statements to understand what was most important to them. Not surprisingly, children are the most important thing for women. When we asked about aspirations, we found that at the base of the pyramid, women's aspirations come from through their children. If they raise their children well, they feel that they have achieved what they hope to achieve. So 74% chose a good education for my child as one of their top five life priorities. But what was also important in the top of the attitudinal statements was being a good wife. Now, that means different things to different people, but it's important. And so we're going to talk in a moment about how it's important to target the family as a whole if you want to reach women. 85% of married women said they identified their husbands as a preferred source um, of advice. On the flip side, 82% of married women said that they were concerned that their phone made their husbands suspicious. Now, this is a really important point because we're here talking about women's empowerment, but empowerment inherently means a change in gender dynamics. Um, I used to talk about the myth of infidelity, that this idea that when a woman gets a phone, a husband fears she's going to go off and cheat on him, and because we were hearing that anecdotally. When we found in our research, was that it's not just about cheating, that it's about just concern about change in the household. There's lots of different things that can happen, and these are things that we really need to consider. Health and finance. Um, improved health, health was a life priority for all, almost two-thirds of the women that we spoke to, and not just health for themselves, but health for their children. What's important to remember at the base of the pyramid is that these women are living on inconsistent incomes, even if they're earning it themselves. They don't always know day to day how much money they're going to have. And so, as you'll see from the quote here, this is a woman from Egypt, she said, I'm always afraid that if one of my children gets sick, I won't have the money to cure them. And so, looking at mobile money and mobile health and how we can align those things is a great opportunity because women worry about unex un unexpected medical expenses because they're the ones who are going to have to take care of it. On the same token, a large majority of the women said, I just wish I could save my own money. Um, and, and for those of you who work in emerging markets or have family emerging markets, I'm sure you've seen this phenomenon of your husband gives you $20, let's say, obviously I'm making that up, you put two of it under the bed, right? And so it's just to keep that savings because you're not sure when you're going to get money again. So women are already hiding money. Now imagine how much safer and more secure that could be through a mobile money platform. So there's a huge opportunity there. And then again, 33% of the women who wanted a phone, these are women who don't own phones and want to own phones, they wanted it in an emergency. So what can we do around emergency services to meet that need? When we looked at young people, there were three really interesting things that came up. First, 83% of all the women we surveyed, now we surveyed 2,500 women across these markets, had not completed secondary education. So the vast majority had not completed secondary education. 31% had no formal education at all. So that tells you a little bit about the demographic that we're working with. But at that same token, 16% of the women between ages 16 to 21 were gaming. They're gaming on low-cost handsets. It's their form of leisure. It's what they're enjoying. So there's an opportunity here. 11% of all of the women in Egypt and 37% of um, the young women in Uganda, something that didn't even occur to any of us, but something that they're interested in. When it comes to the internet, something we've been talking a lot about here, you know, Qualcomm's mentioned huge opportunities for information. 6% of the women we spoke to without being asked knew that you could access the internet on the phone. And only 2% had actually done so. But when we looked at young women, nearly 40% knew it was possible, but only 5% had done it. So this again tells us that we're in a little bit of a premature stage for mobile web for women, but loads of opportunity. These final top 10 findings that I'm going to share with you are from Striving and Surviving, which is our 100-page-plus report coming out on International Women's Day. 
And some of these are a little bit controversial, but they're meant to be thought provoking um, because this is what we learned. When it comes to SMS, 77% of the women had made a call, only 37% had sent an SMS. And we asked them about the utility. We said, we gave them a range, we said, score one out of 100, do you like sending SMSs? And the vast majority said no. And this took a moment internally, I look at my colleague Matt who pushes back on me on this, we said, but people are sending SMSs all the time. And what we found is that it's not that they're not doing it, it's that they don't like doing it. So if you remember when you had your first handset and you were pressing the button three times to get to the number so you could get to the letter so you could send the SMS, they're doing that every day. Not really fun, right? Um, and this is regardless of literacy. So this tells us that if we're gonna design SMS-based programs for women, there has to be a very clear practical utility for them. When it comes to mHealth, we have whole conferences and sessions and opportunities around mHealth. 83% of the women that we spoke to wanted health information. They wanted general health information, they wanted children's health information, and they wanted family planning information. When we asked them if they wanted information, health information on their phone, that number dropped to 39%. Now on one hand, 39%'s not bad. You know, nearly 40% of women want mHealth services. But on the other hand, the market's a lot greater than what we've realized. And so what that tells us is to caution ourselves around demand creation in mHealth. It's important for us to be able to explain clearly to our consumers, particularly our women consumers who are the ones driving healthcare in our homes, that it's even possible to get healthcare on your phone. It's something that's even foreign to many of us still, so you can imagine it's foreign for them. We talked about technical literacy, we talked about targeting the whole family, as I said, addressing suspicion. 64% of BOP women who owned mobile phones as it was making themselves suspicious, or making their husbands suspicious, rather, but what the qualitative stuff told us is a little bit scarier, particularly in Papua New Guinea, that this is potentially leading to domestic violence. It's potentially leading to trying to control women on their mobile phones. And so we really need to look at those dynamics and make sure that we're doing community and family-based education in that space. We know that a lot of women are supplementing the income they have in the best ways they know how, but what's really fascinating is that 73% of the women talked to wanted to be their own boss. They wanted to be entrepreneurs. It doesn't say that they are entrepreneurs, it says that they want to. Um, we partner with the Shri Blair Foundation for Women, who I believe are here in the room around entrepreneurship, and they've got some great findings about what's possible through mobile-based entrepreneurship services, but this is a great um, opportunity we haven't looked into. Talked about the internet, and then we looked at how do you actually reach the women? So now I've just given you, I can see everyone sort of going, okay, this is a lot of information. So I've given you all this information about what's possible in terms of reaching women with products that they want. But then it becomes, how do you go about reaching them? And one of the most interesting things we found is that the way you do your media mix now may actually be the same way that you reach the women more at, at the base of the pyramid. More than half are watching television, 36% daily. They're mostly watching soap operas um, and local content. So there's a huge opportunity here if you're already doing product placement, if you're already doing ad buys, this is a great way to reach the, the women we aim to work with and help close the gap. Women's groups are another way. Women are informally and formally getting together. It's a great way to reach them at scale. But then we also want, you know, for this whole group that we can want to reach, we also caution with one last note that a lot of these women, 38% in fact, are living in a place without either without access to electrical grid or intermittent access to an electrical grid. And someone shared a story with me once that I find really tragic, really. It's a woman in Uganda who had a phone, was excited about using it, was, was she was giving birth and her sister was trying to call a doctor because there were complications during birth. The phone wasn't charged and there was no charging outlet and she died. And that's really extreme, but it, 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 it's very poignant in the fact that it's great to have a phone, but you have to know how to use it, be allowed to use it, and have it be charged at its most fundamental place. So we need to look at low-cost charging solutions um, to make sure that women can get the full benefit of mobile. I'm gonna take a breath. Uh, 
I've given you lots of information. This is just the beginning. One of the important things I want to highlight that all of the tools that we used for this research are available online. So the ethnography guide, the focus group guide, the survey, because what we could only cover four markets. What we want you to do is then go out and do your own research. So download the tools, make it useful for you, and um, Pear, who's here, our research manager, um, can help you through that process. As I said, another report on International Women's Day, and then Women in Health will come out at the Mobile Health Summit in Cape Town. We'll do country-specific reports and more vertical reports. This is another slide you can't read, um, but what I, the reason I put it up here, just as a final quick note, is that, as I mentioned in the beginning, we didn't want to just presume the social impact. We needed to fundamentally understand the social impact. The guys from PwC are here in this corner. I'll let them raise their hands, but they've worked with us to define what are the possible social impacts. So the data points, the numbers that you see in these boxes, and you can download this online, show the number of data points um, within a literature review that relate to different forms of impact. I encourage you to attend the mobile and development intelligence session. Karina's here, um, who works on MDI. That'll be tomorrow, where they will go through this pathway further.